Okay, so you're directing a scene and want to show what your character is going through emotionally. How would you show that? You might have them in a heated conversation. Will you shut up! Shut up! Shut! 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 Shut up! Or show them nervously pacing around. You could go for a big emotional outburst. Or zoom in on them with tears running down their face. All solid choices, right? But would you ever think to show it like this? This simple close-up on the sugar cube can tell us a lot, without saying anything directly. But, wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get back to why this sugar cube is so important in just a second. But first, let's take a step back. You've probably heard people say they prefer the book to the movie adaptation. Sure, some films like Fight Club, The Godfather, or No Country for Old Men might even surpass the book. But more often than not, the book is seen as the better version. I like the book much better. <laughs> Why? Because books engage your imagination. You picture every detail your own way, making the story feel personal. It's like you're co-creating it. Using words, books give you the freedom to see the story through your own lens. They hint at imagination through descriptions that paint just enough of a picture to guide you, but leave plenty open for you to fill in. Take this line from Crime and Punishment. He was crushed by poverty, but the anxieties of his position had of late ceased to weigh upon him. When you read that, you picture Raskolnikov yourself, his tired eyes, his shabby clothes, and here's the magic. Your version of Raskolnikov is entirely yours. He never overacts or breaks character because you've crafted him in your unique way. Each reader's mental imagery is different, making the story deeply personal. You're not just a reader, you're a co-creator of the narrative. Now, in movies, it's the director's vision that leads the way. Every shot, every frame is carefully chosen to guide you toward what they want you to see. The colors, the lighting, the camera angles, they're all decisions that define the story. Unlike books, where you create the imagery in your mind, films provide a more concrete version of the story. It's the director's world, and you're passing through. But what if movies could get close to the same experience you get from reading a book? Maybe not exactly the same, but pretty close. At its core, storytelling is about evoking emotions. In my last video, I talked about how comedy and horror, though challenging, are great playgrounds for new filmmakers as these genres give clear emotional targets, make people laugh or scare them, compared to drama where emotions are more complex and layered. Bringing those feelings and emotions to life in a way that really connects can be very challenging. Sometimes emotions are shown more directly, making them clear but often engaging the viewer's mind more than their deeper emotions. While this approach gets the message across, it doesn't always tap into that deeper, more personal emotional connection. So, how can we convey complex emotions in a simple, poetic, and subtle way? That's what we'll dive into in this video practical ways that can create an emotional connection between the viewer and what's on screen, making the movie feel more personal, as if you were reading a book. The idea of leaving space for the audience to fill in the blanks is one of the ways to turn them into co-creators of the scene. This is Robert Bresson. He was a master at showing just enough, In his films, Bresson often focuses on fragments. A hand reaching for a door handle, followed by the guard's handcuffs linked to another person off screen. This opening scene from A Man Escaped masterfully sets up the character by not giving you the full picture, leaving the rest for your imagination to fill in. But it's in this withholding that Bresson tells so much more. Um, all right, this might sound a bit highbrow, but to really grasp Bresson's method, let's take a quick look at how comic books do something similar, just to give you a clearer picture. When you're reading a comic book, you might see one panel where a character raises their fist, and in the next, someone's already on the ground. What happened in between? That part's left to your imagination, and that's where things get interesting. 
The beauty of comic book storytelling isn't just in the images you see, but in the empty space between the panels. The real magic happens there. Scott McCloud talks about this in his book, Understanding Comics, and he calls that space the gutter. It's where your mind takes over, filling in the gaps and figuring out what happened between the panels. The artist gives you the key moments, but you're the one who completes the story, piecing together the action in your mind. It's an interactive experience. You're not just reading, you're part of the storytelling process. All right, now let's flip back to Brisson. Just like comic books use the gutter, he uses subtle withholding to evoke deep emotions, letting the audience connect and feel the story on a personal level. Those gaps between what you see and what you don't, that's where the real story unfolds. By not showing everything, he actually ends up telling more. It forces you to fill in the blanks, to actively engage with what's not on screen. He's not spoon feeding you. Instead, he's making you part of the storytelling process. His camera doesn't guide you, it provokes you, hinting that the most profound moments are the ones he doesn't put in front of you. This approach transforms the film into an almost spiritual exercise. By holding back, he creates this space, an emotional void you can't help but fill with your own thoughts and feelings. Bresson's restraint makes the film come alive in your mind, revealing layers of meaning you might not have found if everything had been spelled out for you. Now let's look at a different approach to hinting at deeper emotions, one that's equally subtle and powerful. And that brings us back to the scene with the sugar cube. It's from Krzysztof Kieslowski's Three Colors Blue, where we follow Julie as she copes with the sudden loss of her husband and child. In this scene, she's in a cafe where a man who loves her tries to reconnect, but she coldly turns him away. Then, as he leaves, something interesting happens. The film cuts to a close-up of a sugar cube that Julie's holding over her coffee. At first glance, this close-up might seem unnecessary. Why focus on a sugar cube? But Kieslowski is doing something powerful here. By zeroing in on this tiny detail, he's letting us see the world through Julie's eyes. Instead of giving us a straightforward depiction of her emotions, Kieslowski hints at imagination by drawing us into the character's point of view. Her life has been shattered, and she's desperately trying to block out everything that reminds her of her loss. The sugar cube soaking up the coffee becomes a symbol of her attempt to control her world, focusing on the small and trivial to keep her emotions from consuming her. In that moment, nothing else matters. Not the people around her, not the man who loves her, not the busy world outside. It's just this tiny object she can control in a life that has become a complete chaos. In this subtle way, Kieslowski lets us feel Julie's emotional state without needing any dialogue or explanation, making the moment quietly poetic. What's beautiful about this minimalist approach is how it leaves room for each viewer to interpret the moment in their own way. The meaning doesn't need to align perfectly with the director's intent. Whatever resonates with you is just as valid. But the minimalist approach isn't just about subtle objects or point of view shots. Filmmakers have other ways to convey emotion without spelling it out, and one of the most powerful tools is the careful use of framing. This brings us to Ingmar Bergman. One powerful example is in The Virgin Spring, where a father takes brutal revenge after the horrific rape and murder of his daughter, after killing the men responsible, there's this scene where the father kneels down and asks God, why? Normally, you'd expect the camera to be up close, maybe even looking down on him to capture every bit of his emotion. But instead, Bergman does something different. When the father kneels and questions God, and we expect a close-up of his tormented face, he refuses to go there. Instead, Bergman pulls the camera way back, showing the man as a small, isolated figure, almost lost in the frame. You're not being spoon-fed his emotions, but you feel every bit of his emptiness. 
It's one of those choices that lets the scene breathe and speak for itself. The distance leaves everything hinted at, allowing the emptiness of the scene to speak volumes. Bergman's approach here is a great reminder that sometimes stepping back and letting the frame do the work can be far more impactful, allowing us to feel the weight of the moment without being over-directed. By choosing to frame the character from a distance instead of the expected close-up, Bergman lets you co-create the scene. The actor's emotions aren't forced upon you. Instead, you're given space to process the character's emotions on your own, allowing you to connect with them more personally. Just like when reading a book, the writer doesn't spell everything out, but offers clues that help you create and feel the emotion yourself. In a similar manner, when Bergman doesn't show you how he imagined the emotion or how the actor portrayed it, he's letting you feel the emotion for yourself. And this makes the movie feel more personal. And if you don't know, now you know. When emotions are approached more subtly, through small, suggestive moments or leaving space for the audience's imagination, it can resonate on a deeper level. Instead of the audience being shown exactly what to feel, they get to create their own emotional response. In a way, this makes the feelings become more personal and real for them, almost as if they've created the emotion rather than just witnessed it. This can leave a lasting impact, making the experience more profound and memorable. It's in the space between the viewer and the screen where the movie really comes alive. In that moment, when the viewer's imagination takes over, the film becomes more than just images on a flat screen. Much like the gaps in comic books, the audience's creativity and feelings bridge the gaps, making the movie three-dimensional without any need for 3D glasses. This is the best 3D I've ever seen. Mm, I've seen better. Daddy, 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 daddy